Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. It is a day for worship. It is a day for singing. It is a day for prayer. It is a day for going deep and breathing in the Holy Spirit. It is a day to hear the word of God, and it is a day for hearing a word from God. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today's scripture reading comes from Isaiah chapter 51, verses 1 through 6. Listen now for the word of the Lord. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places and will make her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord, 
Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving in the voice of song. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation. For a teaching will go out from me, and my justice for a light to the peoples. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. My salvation has gone out, and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me, for my arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heaven and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and those who live on it will die like gnats. But my salvation will be forever, and my deliverance will never be ended. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Our gospel lesson this morning is taken from Matthew's gospel. The 16th chapter, beginning with the 13th verse, hear God's word as it comes to us from Matthew. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and ever-loving God, we give you thanks for these words from Holy Scripture. We ask that you would help us to understand these words from Matthew's Gospel. We thank you for the story of Jesus' encounter with his disciples at Caesarea Philippi. Inspire us by your word. Fill us with your Holy Spirit as we seek to be faithful in interpreting it. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. How would you answer Jesus' question, Who do you say that I am? That's a very pointed question. I am sure our answers would depend and vary based on where we studied, who our Bible teachers were, how much experience we had in the life of the church. It would depend on how we grew up and what Christian doctrine we learned. Perhaps it would depend on how much time you have spent reading the scriptures or have not spent reading the scriptures. It is a question that Jesus asked his disciples directly. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? His disciples are not shy about responding. They say, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Then Jesus shifts the question directly to them. But who do you say that I am? And sure enough, there is Peter, and he responds very quickly that you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The setting here is really important. William Barclay, the Scottish scholar and preacher, sets the historical tone of Jesus' question to his disciples, and he does it very well. Listen to what he writes. Here indeed is a dramatic picture. Here is a homeless, penniless Galilean carpenter with 12 very ordinary men around him. At that moment, the Orthodox are actually plotting and planning to destroy him as a dangerous heretic. 
Jesus stands in an area littered with the temples to Syrian gods, in a place where ancient Greek gods looked down, in a place where the history of Israel crowded in upon the minds of men and women, where the white marble splendor and the home of Caesar worship dominated the landscape and compelled the eye. And there of all places, this amazing carpenter stands and asks people who they believe him to be. The setting here is so important to think about, so I thought it was important to just give you a brief little movie of uh, my encounter there at Caesarea Philippi. And I think it would help set the tone for this passage of scripture. So let's listen together. The setting of our text this morning is important to our understanding of what's happening and why Jesus question is so important in this setting. Caesarea Philippi is mentioned twice in the New Testament, once in this text in Matthew and another in Mark. Both texts identify the place as the setting for Peter's confession of Jesus as the Messiah. Today the site's known as Banyas, an Arabic word derived from the Greek Panyas. The site is 33 miles north of the Sea of Galilee, and the Hermon River, one of the sources of the Jordan, emerges from a prominent cave at the site. And Panias was a cult center in the Seleucid period. The Greeks built a shrine here to the god Pan, the god of woodlands and caves. Caesar Augustus gave Panias to Herod the Great in 20 BCE. In gratitude, Herod built a temple to Augustus near the cave. In these slides, in the cliff just at the edge of the city, you can see the various temples built to praise other gods. I find it fascinating that this is the context where Jesus asked his disciples, but who do you say that I am? Confronted by the gods of Rome and Greece, ages past and present, and in the midst of Roman power, this is where Jesus asks his question. Following Herod's death, Augustus confirmed his son Philip as the tetrarch of that region which included Panias. To express thanks to the emperor, Philip built a city at Panias which he renamed Caesarea. The city became known as Caesarea Philippi to differentiate it from the Caesarea built along the Mediterranean coast by Herod the Great. King Agrippa II, the last Jewish king to rule that region, enlarged the city. It became a very important center in their government. Perhaps you remember it was King Agrippa II to whom Paul had to testify in Acts of the Apostles. Jesus, again, is using the setting of this city to ask an important question. Who do you say that I am? Rousseau once said, If the life and death of Socrates were those of a sage, the life and death of Jesus were those of a god. Or Napoleon wrote it this way, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I myself have founded empires, but upon what do these creations of our genius depend? Upon force. Jesus alone founded his empire upon love, and to this very day millions would die for him. Or Channing wrote, The sages and heroes of history are receding from us, and history contracts the record of their deeds into a narrower page. But time has no power over the name and the deeds and words of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus lived an inspiring life, many religions that have started, have started after Christianity have had somehow to include Jesus into their teaching or their preaching. They somehow had to include Jesus into their doctrine. Other religions which were around before the Messiah appeared have had to examine his life and make some sort of decision. And Jesus' question to Peter and to the other disciples is the foundation of what we believe. Who do you say that I am? Peter responds, 
You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. It's an amazing setting, isn't it? In the presence of all these temples to various gods at the foot of the cliff in Caesarea Philippi, Peter makes that amazing statement of faith, doesn't he? You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus responds to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I hope you're comforted by those words of Jesus to Peter, whom Jesus chooses to build his church upon, the rock, that faith that he has. He's the first one to say, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus is on you, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I hope that gives you comfort in this time where we wonder about the future of the church. And it's very clear in Jesus' mind, the church will survive and the church will thrive. The church surviving and thriving is something that Jesus says will happen. He won't allow the gates of Hades or the gates of hell to prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm sure you've been wondering about the future of our church here at Providence, waiting for COVID-19 to be over. So this day I had to do something a little bit different. Lee Faber, our facilities manager, and I did something unique today to our sanctuary. When I was on vacation, I was speaking with a friend, a retired pastor, that talked about one church decided to get these swimming noodles as a way of marking our physical distances at that time when we come back into the sanctuary. So we purchased them, we cut them, and we put them on the backs of the pews and then put them in a place, and then every six feet we marked off social distance, every other row, and we used different color noodles. We used green and pink and blue and yellow, and you'll see a picture of our sanctuary right now have to tell you that it gave me hope that at some point the church will reopen. At some point we will have some semblance of what worship is all about together. I know it's been a challenge for all of us. We're not sure how it's going to come out on the other side, but we know that Jesus said that the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. So in some ways I did that kind of rainbow color as a sign of hope that one day we will be able to gather together and worship, and we're looking ways that we can maybe do it outside and gather um, for Bible studies. So pray for us, be patient with us, but know this. The important part of the pericope this morning about our gospel text is responding to Jesus' question. Who do you say that I am? Often in the ministry, I've heard statements from people who have difficulty believing in Jesus. Sure, he was a good moral teacher. He was a kind man. Perhaps he was a physician and a healer. But I just can't believe that somehow Jesus is the Son of God. Marcus Borg, in his book, Jesus, A New Vision, writes this. He says, What Jesus was like is as much of a challenge to both church and culture in the late 20th century as it was in his own time. People were trying to figure out who Jesus was, even his disciples. When Jesus asked them, who do you say the Son of Man is, they had all these different answers from people. Some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. People were trying to figure out who is this healer, who is this miracle maker, who is this one who teaches with authority. And there is Peter right in the center when he responds, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus is encouraged. Jesus said, for you, Peter, on you, on this foundation, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So this morning, I want all of us to have hope, continue to pray for each other, but continue to ask that question, who do you say that Jesus is? So take another look at Jesus and answer that question. 
How you answer that question, how I answer that question, how we as a church answer that question will determine our direction and where we're headed. Will you allow the opinions of others to shape your understanding of Jesus? Or will you continue to study, to challenge those questions? If you have doubts, will you go deeper and realize that our doubts are encompassed by our faith? And those doubts can be a catalyst to take us even deeper in our relationship with Jesus Christ as our Messiah, as our Lord and Savior. Because the Gospels are about relationships. The relationships that Jesus has with his disciples where he teaches us about our relationship with God. After walking with Jesus, after seeing Jesus teach and preach and proclaim that the kingdom of God is at hand, when he's asked directly by Jesus, who do you say that I am? Peter responds, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Friends, God is not dead. He is surely alive, as one of the contemporary Christian songwriters writes. God is not dead. God is doing amazing things in the midst of this pandemic. God will continue to lead us through this difficult time. But this week, wrestle with the question, Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? How we answer that questions, that question as Christians will determine how we move forward in our life of faith. Will you choose this week to continue to have a living encounter with a living God? I hope all those bright colored swimming noodles made you smile, maybe made you think of a rainbow, of a new beginning, of the covenant that we will be back together again soon. In the meantime, pray for one another, pray for each other, continue to study your Bibles, and continue to make a difference in our world today. Please join me in prayer. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for this message of hope. Help us to believe your words. We don't know what the outcome will be or how the church will change, but we know that all these events will not prevail against the church. Help us to put our faith and trust in you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And now I invite you to join me in our time of prayer. Holy God, with you there is no darkness. Your character has no shadows, and you are pure and good. Yet in our broken world, we see so much darkness around us. Pain, sickness, and disease are in our community and in many homes. Bring your light and restoring presence to the dark places of our lives. Bring your hope to our hearts that feel defeated. Bring your love and compassion to those in pain. Give us faith to say with the psalmist, Lord, you light my lamp. My God illuminates my darkness. May your light of hope shine in the darkness for families today. Show us glimpses of your presence with us and the comfort you bring. In the busyness of today, Lord, help us to take moments to be still and sit with you, to slow down, breathe deeply, and release our burdens to your strong hand. You are trustworthy, good, and true. And we thank you for caring for us so deeply and so beautifully. Open our eyes to see you at work today, Lord. Give us your light. And now be with us as we pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness, the 
worshiping with us today and thank you for your generous support of the ministries at Providence Presbyterian Church and now as you leave this worship space and place uh, may you go out into the world carrying the love and kindness and compassion of our Lord and Savior and may you share it with all whom you meet in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all God's people say amen